<laughs> Hi, I'm Nadia Gossidy, and I am the Associate University Librarian for Special Collections Services. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to Washington University Libraries and the Julian Edison Department of Special Collections. And I think this is hopefully going to be the first of many Independence Day celebrations that, that we have. Um, we're so thrilled and, and really humbled to see as many people here today. And again, apologies for the delay. Uh, so today we have the wonderful opportunity to hear from our distinguished speaker, Professor David Koenig, and to see our very rare copy of the Declaration of Independence. Our curator of rare books, Cassie Brand, has also selected some related materials that will be in display in the Julian Edison Department of Special Collections Reading Room, which is right around the corner if you go back out. And some of the highlights of that material uh, includes autographs from Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. So please do uh, make a point to, to see those materials. Now for today only, because we have some goodies out, we ask that we don't touch anything. Typically, you're free to touch, but since we have cupcakes and cookies, we will ask no touching today. And also, if, if you could keep all food and drink in uh, your respective rooms, wherever you may be, and um, not to carry it around or take it into the Declaration Chamber. So I also welcome you today, if you have the time, to explore our other exhibitions in both the Thomas Gallery and the Newman Tower of Collections and Exploration. The libraries recently completed a $22 million renovation that created these spaces, as well as many others, and what this did was ultimately quintuple our exhibition spaces. So we are going to have a lot more exhibits, a lot more events to come in the, in the coming years. So now I'm going to introduce our very distinguished speaker today, Professor David Koenig, who is a professor of law and a professor emeritus of history. He is nationally and internationally recognized expert in Anglo-American legal history with a focus on property law, the Second Amendment, and the law of freedom and slavery. He is a leading authority on Thomas Jefferson and the development of law in colonial, revolutionary, and early national America. He's the author and editor of several books and numerous articles. He has served as an expert witness or consultant in cases concerning property rights before the Supreme Court of the United States, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and the Maine Supreme Judicial Court. Maine, mm, the state of Maine, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A former senior, senior research fellow for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, he co-directed the restoration of a colonial era courthouse and developed curatorial and educational materials for the programs that have been seen by thousands annually. He is currently editing the legal papers of Thomas Jefferson for the papers of Thomas Jefferson and writing a book on Jefferson's legal thought and practice, Thomas Jefferson and the Republic of Law. He has received numerous fellowships and awards, including Washington University's Distinguished Faculty Award, and if I went on, we would be here all afternoon. And uh, more personally, Professor Koenig has been an invaluable asset to the libraries as we designed and planned for the Declaration Exhibition. He lent us his extensive knowledge and expertise to ensure that what we presented was uh, a declaration exhibition that had the appropriate historical context. And I'm very grateful to him for, for that guidance, as well as his continued support and uh, engagement and, and willingness to share his, his knowledge with groups like this. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Professor Koenig. Yesterday, when uh, I had the privilege of, uh, of being on Don Marsh's uh, NPR, interview program the um you having trouble hearing in the back yeah, yeah. 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 i'll go into my professorial stentor stentorian <laughs> yeah i think we're getting a mic <coughs> well we'll try Let's try it see sounds like it's really good does this work in the back? No. no. Let me turn the volume Does this work in the back? Yeah. Better. 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 Yeah. Try a little more. Okay, again, testing. How are we doing there in the back? Better. Well enough? Good enough? 
Yes. yes. Better is an okay. Good. <laughs> Sometimes better is enough. But anyhow, when, when I was uh, with uh, Don Marsh yesterday, and Naj and Cassie were uh, in, they interviewed all together with us. Um, uh, Marsh asked, uh, "What is the most valuable?" Get the louder yet. What is the most valuable thing about the collection at the Washington University Library? And I interjected and I said, "The staff." <laughs> and I meant that, and Nadja has certainly, Nadja and Cassie and others uh, have certainly demonstrated that uh, in this whole process. Uh, and when she first asked me, when Nadja first asked me to, to talk uh, about the Declaration, uh, I was quite happy, not just because I was able to give back to Washington U for so much of the benefits uh, and, and good uh, graces that I've received from it over, over 45 years here, uh, but that I wouldn't have to talk again about Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> but on a more somber note, it's impossible to do that. It's impossible to do that uh, because so much of, uh, of what we know about Jefferson is or concerns his bitter rivalry with Alexander Hamilton. And it's a rivalry that's very revealing about American national identity. Uh, it was personal, I'll tell you that, uh, but it went beyond the personal. And um, we have to realize that uh, Hamilton, the uh, wonderfully portrayed individual in the in Broadway uh, musical, had lots of enemies. Jefferson was not the only person who despised Alexander Hamilton. So too did Honest John Adams. And uh, anyone who can arouse the hatred of both um, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who didn't agree on very much through most of their political career, really has to be reckoned with whenever we talk about the American founding. Uh, despite the fact that Hamilton, at the writing, drafting, ratification of the Declaration of Independence, was only 19 years old uh, and was serving in the Continental Army, uh, dreaming of fame and glory. So, um, but we can't understand the, direct, the, the Declaration if we don't include Hamilton and what he stood for as a count of contrapuntal alternative to many of the ideas being expressed in the Declaration. Uh, and to think of the Declaration as springing full-blown from the mind of Thomas Jefferson, much as uh, Athena sprang from the brow of Zeus, uh, we miss a lot of understanding about the totality of American political culture and the American founding. If we only look at one side of the debate, if we only look at what Jefferson wrote here, without understanding that it was written in a very divided political atmosphere, that it was written as, part, as one polar opposite of much else that was being said about American politics at the time, we'll have a situation that I like to compare to the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> because if we don't recognize both hands, both sides of this lively and indeed bitter debate at the time, uh, we, we won't appreciate the Declaration. We, we won't, uh, and it, would, it will now speak to us, I hope, to make clear today, much more loudly and clearly than uh, other whys. Because declaring independence was, as you might imagine, a controversial and highly contested step to take. Uh, we forget all too often, because uh, we know how it turned out, or we hope we do, uh, that uh, this was a revolution. It was revolutionary, it was radical for its day. And it was radical uh, in a way because it sought to establish a republic, that is to say, a government without a king. And this was a highly radical idea at the time. Now, there were other republics. Uh, in fact, the most prominent at the time was probably the Venetian Republic, uh, the republic you see when you visit Venice and you see these doddering old doges uh, who uh, were ruled by this mercantile oligarchy. So it was, it, Venice was a republic, but wasn't a democratic republic. And that's the difference. What we see being attempted here 
is the creation of a democratic republic. Now, that's a, a, a radical step to take because democracy was a pejorative term at the time. People spoke of the democracy, just as I spoke of the aristocracy or the monarchy. The democracy was the mass of the people. It was an unformed mass, ruled by the many who defied conventional political wisdom by insisting that they could create a democracy run by the democracy, which is to say that they were embarking upon an experiment of handing government to a, uh, an untried political system called democracy. And there was the big question as the, the nation was founding, so we call them the founders, and I will not use the term framing, fa uh, was it, uh, uh, framing. founding fathers, I won't use that term, the founders, uh, at most, uh, I'll, I'll go that far, uh, were facing the question of how do you found a government without the cohering, organizing, and stabilizing forces that everyone expected. A king, an aristocracy, an established church. All of these served, had served, for centuries as a way to bring order to the democracy, to the people. And this was, as I said, a controversial idea. John Adams, after uh, after the revolution, he commented that he would estimate that only about a third of the American people supported independence and the establishment of democracy. Mm -hmm. Another third were indifferent about it, and a third actively opposed it as a dangerous experiment that was doomed to failure. Failure in the form of, uh, of, of, of disorder, of internal fighting, and finally the emergence of a tyrant. So, the uh, well, reason I, I begin with this is that Alexander Hamilton, let's go back to Hamilton, uh, whether to the degree he embraced this contrary idea, represented to Americans at the time, and historically has represented a tradition of more than a little distrust of the people, a distrust of the capability of the people to create their own government. There's an anecdote that lived on for years, and we still tell it, although we, we, we caveat it, that uh, there was a dinner in New York, uh, right after the ratification of the Constitution, where one of the members of the dinner party were going on about how wonderful it was that we were now vesting authority in the people. And one of the other guests, none other than Alexander Hamilton, is said to have banged his hand on the table and said, impatiently and somewhat exhausted, replied with much emphasis, your people, sir, your people is a great beast. Now, we've, we've tried to verify this, and we've never uh, gotten verification. We've never found uh, some. This is uh, told many years later by a descendant of Hamilton's and someone who actually was a, a big fan of Hamilton. And part of this enduring American tradition that distrusted the people. And in, in, as we historians have tried to track down this quotation and not found the, the mouth from which it emerged, we found other statements by Hamilton of his great distrust of the people. Uh, one of those uh, is that he, at one point, uh, criticized people who believed in the pernicious dreams of democracy. Pernicious dreams. And he compared the people, not to the great beast, but to quasi-beast, uh, Polyphemus uh, from Virgil's Aeneid, the Cyclops, uh, who is blinded and who stumbles and wreaks havoc and destruction, quote, as a, sh a monster, shapeless, huge, blind, easily misled by demagogues. Uh, this we do have from Hamilton's pen, if not from his mouth. But his fears were shared. He was not unique in this. They were shared by many, in the, if not all, in the Republican uh, in this Republican Democratic Revolutionary effort. Like Hamilton, many people believed and looked to a British-style government ruled by a mercantile elite uh, sufficient to bring order to society. Hamilton, in, in his reports on manufacturers, which we should read as much as we read uh, his contributions to the Federalist, 
spoke of his deep admiration for Adam Smith and his belief, citing Smith, that the, the invisible hand of market forces, if allowed to operate by the government and with its support, would bring order to society. Market forces would be sufficient to bring order to society. He modeled, in fact, his, his great contribution is, is as the first Treasury Secretary, Secretary of Treasury. If you read the statutes that created the cabinet offices, the Secretary of Treasury has more power than any other cabinet official. Uh, in fact, he operated the Treasury <coughs> Department by meddling in all sorts of other parts of the government. Meddling with the courts, meddling with the Secretary of State. Thomas Jefferson hated that meddling. Uh, but he used it in such a way that we see him basically trying to create in the United States, through the office of the Treasury, the same role that Sir Robert Walpole in England had used to, to turn his office of First Lord of the Treasury into the first powerful <coughs> executive Prime Minister of England. So what we see is an effort to create the Treasury office into a secretary, into a prime minister's office that would have executive as well as other administrative duties in government. Now, that being said, he certainly used the, uh, the, the, the Treasury to establish the government on its, sorry, am I getting feedback? Oh, I thought I, oh. okay. Um, he did use the Treasury uh, Department to establish a firm fiscal basis for the you government. Know, without which the government would not survive. I think that's fairly clear. And even Madison, uh, as quoted by Lynn manuel Miranda, says the same thing. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll give credit for credit as due. But Hamilton, uh, but, but aside from that, he resented efforts to democratize government. He resented criticisms of his efforts as being contrary to democracy as contrary to Republican republicanism for being uh, an attempt to give power to a small commercial elite, most of which were his friends, as a matter of fact, um, and to use George Washington as a kind of puppet uh, for, his, uh, for his efforts. In fact, at this point, Washington really was slipping into, into his old age, and I can speak from experience, uh, one does slow down a bit uh, in one's old age, and was trying to dominate him. Uh, Hamilton was trying to dominate um, uh, Washington much in the way um, other, uh, well, Eisenhower is part of the example of that. Uh, but, it, but at any rate, um, when the Whiskey Rebellion occurred in, in 1794, uh, Hamilton took a step to create the largest army that had ever existed in the United States, larger than any army that George Washington had ever commanded in order to crush the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, to show overpowering armed force to demonstrate the need for obedience to the federal government. Five years later, during another tax protest, he actually proposed to the Secretary of Defense, or War, Secretary of War at the time, that he established, quote, a provisional army, a provisional army to awe the disaffected when there were protests. So we have a different vision of government. Now, I must emphasize, Hamilton, Jefferson, did not disagree on the potential for popular disorder, for the potential of political, if indeed even chaos, if steps were not taken to make a democracy work. It's the solutions that they disagreed over. And this document, is much of a statement of this Jeffersonian and uh, we hope more mainstream American view of what rule by the people really uh, means. The Declaration gave voice to the grievances that were very real under the British. But Jefferson and others knew that they were sitting on a powder cake, a popular powder cake of disaffection and of potential violence. They had seen in the lead up to the revolution many, many instances of mob violence getting out of control and working to undercut 
the effort to achieve a functional democracy. So um, when he produces, right, when he's called upon to write a declaration of justifying American independence, he lists many of these grievances. You'll recognize some of these uh, uh, when they're read tomorrow. NPR you know, has things that people read the declaration a uh, bit. Uh, you may recognize some of these from yesterday's front pages as well, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the declaration, and I quote, speaks of the king who has obstructed the administration of justice. He has made judges dependent on his will. He has refused to assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He is guilty of, quote, obstructing the laws for the naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration to the United States. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. So all of these have something in common. What they have in common is uh, the use of executive authority, in this case the king, to, refresh, to frustrate the exercise of power exercised by the people. Again, in the words of the Declaration, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Well, um, this is just quoting the Declaration. Uh, um, no, not much of a But anyhow, we should note that uh, a year before the Declaration, that is in July 1775, um, Congress sent to the king its declaration, uh, before it sent the Declaration, its olive branch petition, which was a petition <coughs> seeking reconciliation with the crown. The king refused to read the petition and dismissed it out of hand and instead declared the well, Declaration of Independence. Here we have a declaration he gives of open, I'm quoting, open and avowed rebellion against the king. So uh, Congress was I say, aware of the extent of this popular distaste for the government which is being imposed upon them. But again, they realize they're sitting on a powder keg of potential chaos. How could they trap, how could they <coughs> channel this political expression into a constructive direction that would fulfill, as he would say, the goals of achieving life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? How to do that? Well, the Declaration announces a strategy right up front. Let the facts be submitted to a candid world. Facts. Say that again. Facts. Let facts be presented to the people and to the world. Because the much of political expression by the colonists uh, had been uh, really manipulated by demagoguery and disinformation. That is to say, of them alternative facts uh, that were circulated as rumor uh, at a time when the verification of a rumor or the repudiation of a rumor was almost impossible. It took five days, pretty much, to get from Philadelphia to Boston. We'll return to that fact in a moment. What would people know about what would happen? If they sent something to Boston from Philadelphia, it would take 10 days or more to get an answer back. In the meantime, discontent 
brood discontent uh, uh, became reached uh, a flash point. So let me give you a, an example of, of how this worked and how and why we have this document and how and why it was distributed in the way it was. And this occurred in September of 1774, which is well before Lexington and Concord. And uh, a rumor uh, followed the fact, the very fact, that the military governor, Boston, uh, Massachusetts had a military governor uh, by this time, uh, General Sir Thomas Gage, uh, had sent his troops to Charlestown, just north of Boston, to confiscate uh, gunpowder that had been stored by the local militias. And nothing happened. Uh, they, they took the, um, the, the gunpowder, nothing uh, occurred. Uh, but immediately, news of this episode, quote unquote news, began to circulate. And it's a lot like an 18th century version of the child's game of telephone. Because by the time it got to uh, Philadelphia from Boston, the news was that uh, Gage had fired upon and killed seven uh, Americans uh, at, um, at, at Charlestown, and that now, in re retribution, the British fleet and the British army surrounding Boston were now bombarding and destroying the city of Boston, mm -hmm. murdering as is, men, women, and children of without distinction of age or sex. Well, this news flew like lightning across, um, across New England. Uh, and within days, a spontaneous uprising of, ten, of more than 10,000 <coughs> troops, uh, militia, Minutemen, had responded to this news. Um, any appeal for <laughs> calm produced uh, a charge of disloyalty. Uh, any um, effort to say, well, let's, let's try to look at this fact, let's, let's look at it skeptically, was met with uh, charges of treason. Uh, and it, when the news got to Philadelphia, where the First Continental Congress was assembling, the delegates were scared beyond words. Their families were back in Boston. John Adams wrote uh, to, uh, to, to Abigail uh, that we, we are waiting with utmost anxiety and impatience for further intelligence. I guess I said further intelligence, because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about intelligence being communicated. Now, the reason we don't talk about this destruction of the city of Boston in September 1774 is that it never happened. Uh, it was a rumor. Uh, but the fact that it was a rumor that was so readily accepted and had such a volcanic result is worth our attention. It's worth, indeed, our, uh, our, our prudence and our heeding of all of this. I mean, any moment's reflection would have uh, revealed that this could not be true. I mean, Boston was packed with loyalists, supporter of the, supporters of the crown, who had fled the countryside for protection by the British fleet, not destruction by the British fleet. So it's a completely illogical rumor, but it had legs and it spread down uh, to Philadelphia. So uh, what we have to understand is this is the circumstance. These are the circumstances of communication in a situation where the people must be kept informed, the people must be kept informed, but must be kept informed accurately, or else there's no controlling, no guiding popular protest. So um, when Congress in the summer of 1776 assembled to, uh, in second, <coughs> Assembly, uh, Second Congress, Congress assembled to draft other action. It realized that it was incumbent upon them to make sure that in a democracy, the people were brought into the process. The people were informed of what was going on. So that they had to present principles and facts, facts, that would rationally appear, appeal to their best instincts and not to generating or igniting a frenzy of uncontrolled and misdirected uh, violence. In fact, uh, we can get to this uh, as a broadside. Uh, you're probably aware of broadside is a single sheet. It's distributed widely. It's, just, it's a single sheet, so it can be, there you go. <laughs> I love it. Uh, 
<laughs> it's distributed so it can be plastered up on a bulletin board outside a church, outside a courthouse, outside a town meeting hall. And actually, earlier that spring, we see uh, another revealing broadside uh, issue. This is a broadside that Richard Henry Lee of Virginia put together using mostly the words of John Adams, with whom he was communicating uh, for wisdom about how to establish uh, government. And he made a broadside. He labeled principles of government, which he then had circulated. It didn't circulate as widely as this, but it was circulated certainly through most of Virginia and much of, much of, the, much of the colonies. Uh, this government scheme where we see the leaders of the revolution purposefully shaping revolution even as they announced it. That's what we have to realize here too. This doesn't just announce revolution. It shapes, it describes, it invokes principles of revolution. So um, when we um, look at the way that, um, that information travels, we have to see that it's a necessity to have this kind of information. It's indeed uh, something without which a democracy cannot function. But it scared, the, the mobilization of the people scared, uh, really intimidated, a lot of people who disagreed with the British control of North America, but were unwilling to embark upon this experiment of drawing the people in. Uh, Jefferson, uh, shortly after, uh, actually a few years after writing the Declaration, uh, again, when his philosophy of government was coming under attack from the Federalist, much more conservative party, he made a very, very revealing remark. He said, the boisterous sea of liberty is never without a wave. The boisterous sea of liberty is never without a wave. And the reason there is that democracy is messy. It is. But it has to exist. And it has to be fed and nourished by uh, rational, deliberative information. <laughs> uh, Tom Paine, when he wrote Common Sense, showed how this works. He says, uh, in England, uh, the king is law. In America, the law is king. <laughs> it is an absolute truth in absent governments that the king is law. So it is in free countries that the law ought to be king. And there ought to be no other king. But should any bad use afterwards arise with this authority, let the crown, that is even a popular crown, be demolished and then scattered among the people whose right it is. Well, when you scatter authority, you embark on a dangerous mission. And this is something that the revolutionary founders were aware of, the people. Uh, authority was scattered among the people, was scattered among the states. So it was necessary for, actually as early as uh, the Stamp Act crisis in the 1760s and accelerated into the 70s as, uh, as, as the uh, confrontation between the empire and the colonies became more intense and fraught, it became necessary to form what are called committees of correspondence, where each state would notify the other states officially of what was going on and what actions it was taking and why. These evolved into what became called committees of safety as they became more concerned with the safety of their inhabitants. But when Massachusetts uh, took this uh, to that next step uh, in the 1770s, it said that we must announce to the world what we are doing. And they meant not just the colonies, not just Bostonians, but to the world. Uh, and this information would be certified, as it were, legitimate by those who were disseminating the information. So as the delegates tried to, uh, to write a manifesto, this is as much as an announcement, that would turn the energies of the people from a dangerously erratic, unpredictable force into a cohesive population, committed to the creation of effective institutions of popular democracy, such communication was necessary. Two years earlier, they picked Jefferson because two years earlier, 
uh, in 74, he had written uh, a pamphlet, uh, actually anonymously at the time, uh, a summary view of the rights of British America. People said, who wrote this? Who wrote this? Uh, and it finally became known that it was Jefferson. And when he got to Philadelphia, he's the man. Uh, to write this declaration, because the, the, the summary view was a methodical, lawyerly, rational indictment of the king, and the declaration takes the same form. I'll give you a little lawyerly insight from the 18th century about the declaration. It reads like what used to be uh, very common in courts, called a bill in chancery, uh, or a bill in equity. Uh, and a bill in equity, um, or in the chancery court, is the form that is used when a trust is dissolved. When a trust, trust that is, power is given to a group of trustees for the benefit of another party of beneficiaries, when that trust is violated and is not used in such a way as to benefit the beneficiaries, the court is petitioned with this bill in chancery to dissolve this. And that's how the declaration reads. When in the course of human events, it recites all of the reasons that the king, as a trustee of the liberties of the people, has forfeited the authority that this compact had once given. It begins, as we say, a law, how a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government uh, to provide new guards for their future security. So Congress knew that it had to channel the incipient eruption of violence and political force into a productive, creative course of action. So Jefferson and this committee of five uh, worked very hard at this. They're utterly exhausted by the time uh, this was uh, finish it, finished. Um, and they wrote beneath this shadow of ambivalence. And I think it's a, a pause minute and understand that. They wrote under a cloud of potential doubt as to what they were doing. And I think that's important to realize about the Declaration, because in many ways we say, well, it hasn't lived up to its, its aspirations, because it was an aspirational document. They were writing more out of hope than of expectation, really. And this is why uh, the Declaration of Independence was open to such uh, interpretation. Uh, it's, it's an, as I say, it's an aspirational document that has to be understood. It also is a, a document of compromise and collaboration. The Committee of Five that worked on this uh, did not necessarily agree with everything within themselves. And the document, for better or for worse, better we see at least it got out, worse because it had to eliminate some things out of compromise. I mean, Jefferson was really embittered by the fact that they, the committee and, and the Congress approved the removal of an indictment of slavery from the Declaration. So um, it's an aspirational document whose many permutations we have to understand. But that's why um, Congress, uh, late in July 4th, uh, sent it to John Dunlap, a printer, to work overnight to print over 200 copies of what had just been approved. And we have to realize this is a difficult process. You don't just push a, just put a print button uh, for this. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure there's no toner uh, in, the, uh, in the tray. Uh, you know, these are individually you know, printed. They have to be hung up to dry. Uh, and you can't do anything with them until they dry. You know, okay. Uh, Sandal, is it dry? I don't know. That's, that's good. Uh, no, no, give it a little time. Um, so, this is a deliberate process, and by early in the morning, July 5th, it was ready to go. It was packed into saddlebags, and off the riders went uh, to the various uh, colonies to tell them that they were no longer colonies, but something called, and this is the first use of the term, the United States of America. And concluding, it says, uh, it, it, it empowered them with a detailed, if not detailed, but certainly an emphatically urgent uh, uh, obligation that to secure these rights, the ones they start off with, secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. 
and to institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. It's, it, we have to realize that this was now read to the people. The people were mobilized. In fact, uh, many of the old, I've you know, seen thousands of, of Jefferson documents and manuscripts. There's one that's always puzzled me and other historians is that one of the drafts that Jefferson wrote of the Declaration has not dashes between it, but sort of, you know, the long underline that you get in your word processing. Uh, you know, why is there a long underline between some sentences and not others? And it wasn't until recently that a historian at Stanford figured out that this was a reader's guide to when to pause. <laughs> a reader's guide to when to let something sink in. Because it had to sink in to the people. It had to be read to mobilize. One of the first readings publicly of the Declaration was to George Washington's army. Why? Well, because his army was an army of volunteers. It was not an army like the <coughs> British Army, which was conscripts, nor was it an army like much of the British Armed Force that was hired German mercenaries fighting for a cause they didn't even, couldn't even read about. This was an effort to mobilize a democratic society in order to bring about a democratic government. And they never doubted that it would be difficult. And the boisterous sea would always have a way. But they concluded, and there's a word here I want to return to, that it requires us all, as it requires them to mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I want to conclude on that word mutually because it's usually overlooked. But this was a document of mutual communal commitment to an ideal that um, now would bring the people together to effect their own happiness and not to be led about by a demagogue or a dictator. And I hope you'll think of that when NPR reads it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>